following our random reflections of one year in marriage, I had the chance to put my husband in the hot seat and just dig a little deeper into some of the issues that came up in episode one of our unscripted series. I've seen a moments of fighting and conflict and I wish I didn't have to deal with some of that. There's this person that even though they gave you nothing, you're willing to do so much for them. I want to be bribed by many people to know that I did my part to be a blessing to as many people as possible. So, let's dig in. Vegetakas is about, what, two weeks old? And um, it's had some pretty positive reception so far. How do you feel about the podcast, generally? Hi. Uh, it's exciting to consider what we managed to do with the first uh, episode of the unscripted uh, YouTube series by the Chitakas. And I think what's very humbling is uh, the wealth of insight and revelation that was inside the podcast itself. It's ironic that sometimes you imagine the one who is delivering the message doesn't need the message. But that is the true essence of being a messenger, is the very message you're delivering, you may also find value in, right? So I stopped for a second and went back to listen to the podcast. And I was like, oh, that sounds good. Oh, that sounds good. And I'm excited because I'm quite certain that uh, a few months from now, a year from now, I may have to go back to the same very podcast to find insight and revelation to navigate different dynamics of my own marriage. And that is testament of the power of God. And if we give the glory to God when someone speaks about the wisdom they found in a podcast, that's where it's derived from, because you know, it is not by my power, not by might, but by the Spirit of God. But we've uh, been shown a lot of love. We set on this podcast with a belief that could bless many marriages. But no one could have told us that in a week's time we could have had 3,000 views. But that's testament that the message we had was timely for the people. And we're not craftsmen. We're not geniuses that imagine what does the world need in this time and we give them that. But we just gave what was true to our hearts. The passion of looking for equipment to be able to pull off the podcast. And that's where the idea of uh, following the Spirit comes in. Because you have a certain burden in your heart, a leading to do something. A leading as simple as go buy camera equipment for a podcast. And you're going all around learning about cameras to buy equipment. And you do not know what God is going to do with it. You have an idea that we're going to do a podcast. But you don't know what's going to come of it. The inconveniences, the sacrifices to get this equipment available. And then you find at the end of the day that people are truly blessed. And in, there, in that moment, you're actually delighted and thankful that you heeded the call and you obeyed and you did what you're supposed to do. And in all that, we give glory to God. And that, for me, humbles me ever more, the idea to learn to be led by the Spirit of God, uh, to listen to things that may not make sense to me in the moment. But because there's a conviction within me, the conviction is a spirit on the inside of me that bears witness of certain things. If I have that conviction, I don't decide whether it makes sense to my kind of mind. And that's the difference. Because things that are of destiny may not make sense to the kind of mind. But the spirit within you bears witness. That's what it means to be a spiritually minded individual. Your decisions are not made carnally. Your decisions are made spiritually. So certain things require of us obedience. Not understanding, but obedience. Because we know in part that God knows the end from the beginning. So as long as I stay yielded to the yielding of God, to the yielding of the Spirit, the sky is the limit. There's lots of issues that could have been tackled. Why marriage? I had a revelation that had the family is the smallest unit of society. And when you think about society, whether it be a tribe or a nation, it is made up of different families coming together, making clans, making tribes, making nations, making the world. And when you go at the root of this family unit, you find at the very bottom of it is a bond 
between a man and a woman that come into a marriage and create that foundation. Now, when you think about uh, the failure of uh, clans or tribes or nations, you're going to find at the heart of it is a failure of marriages. But then I came to the realization that the journey of marriage is a journey that is uh, so important and yet so complicated and yet there's not much education about it. And one of the things that was fundamental to us studying the Chitaka's podcast, I remember someone sharing with me something they had been told that marriage is like a, a, a room with tinted glasses where the people on the inside can see what's on the outside, but on the outside can't see what's inside. What that showed me, many people are in marriages dealing with the same things that their neighbors are dealing with, but each of them thinks theirs are the most complicated ones. So what I felt important, if my wife and I share our story, our journey of marriage, par adventure, couples out there may start to find parallels. They're like, oh wait, that's normal. They've dealt with it as well. And perhaps as we start to share different ways and different approaches, we can all be blessed. And I hope that when you strengthen the bonds of families, you create a good atmosphere that raises children. A lot of children who they turn out to become, whether to become their very best or to be great or to be mediocre or to be average, at the heart of it all, you may find there was a bond between a man and a woman that was created a, a good environment that allowed the student to thrive. And that is my hope that the Chitaka's podcast is not just looking at marriage in isolation, but we believe that marriage is at the foundation of society and the world itself. Interesting. Let's talk about impact. What does that look like for you? My desire is that people can transition from approaching marriage as a carnal reality and they approach marriage as a spiritual reality. I have come to realize that sometimes the reason we struggle with marriage because we are too carnally minded. And to expound on that, uh, when you're carnally minded, it means you're led by the flesh. And all the nature of selfishness, uh, self-consciousness, the, the I, 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 that I is sort of like a poison for the union of marriage. Now, when you go spiritually minded, you start to come to the idea of someone being dead to themselves. When you're dead to them yourself, then you can consider the other. When the Bible tells you love your neighbors, you love yourself. A lot of people know it, but a lot of us do not understand it. What does it mean to love your neighbor as you love yourself? It means if you had the loaf of bread, you split it in the middle, one half for you and half for your friend. But how many of us approach marriage in that regard? When you think about the union of marriage, it is a, a lifelong union. And the desire ought to be that my wife and I should have the best experience of life, each of us as individuals. It's not about one of us winning. It's about both of us winning. That if I desire something good for myself, I all desire the same for my spouse. And I feel if we succeed with the Chitakas, I believe we'll find a world, a society, where husband and wife are working together to make marriage work, but they're willing to sacrifice themselves for the good of the whole. The greatest achievement for me is to hear testimonies of uh, marriages that were the brink of failure that were brought back to life as a result of this podcast. What I want to hear is that uh, uh, families did better decisions as a result of the podcast. What I want to hear is that a husband was more loving as a result of this podcast. What I want to hear is that a, a, a wife was more respectful to her husband as regard of this podcast. So I feel when people's lives are actually made better, therein I'll find my fulfillment. Because if something is a calling, if I am a messenger, I do not take glory in the message. I am simply a messenger. But what I can glory is that I did my part to deliver the message. And to whom the message was sent, they were able to receive it. And that message was able to transform their life. There I find fulfillment. I know we achieved our part of the podcast. Now, there could be someone watching this and they're not sure if it is for them. Who exactly 
are the Chitakas looking to speak to? Who's the target audience? The journey of marriage is an interesting one. And uh, in a way, I speak to myself. <laughs> I speak to myself. The, the experience of marriage I've gone through, I've seen the hard times of marriage. I've seen the moments of fighting and conflict. And I wish I didn't have to deal with some of that. And marriage is sort of this institution the world it has people exiting it, there are always new entrants. It's part of life. And my desire is if I was a new entrant entering marriage once again, what do I wish I had known? And I hope this podcast speaks to the me that is just entering the institution of marriage that is going to get some insights and learning that will make the journey much smoother for them. I, my desire is that each generation that enters marriage does not have to lay new foundation. That can we build on the shoulders on the shoulders of the giants that came before us, and as we keep adding the brick, brick by brick, the future generations that come will find marriage much simpler. At least let them solve new challenges, but all the challenges we've been solving. The, in that in that regard, society won't be progressing. We are not adding on if we're doing solving the same problems day in and day out. Let's talk about legacy. Let's talk about your dream. I've always had a dream. I wanted to be buried by millions of people. And it's not out of the desire of vanity that, oh, look how many people buried that man. But my desire is that my life was lived in such a way that was impactful to the lives of many people in this world, that my passing, they desire to remember me, right? So I don't want to be buried by many people, so come and show how big I was. I want to be buried by many people to know that I did my part to be a blessing to as many people as possible, that their lives will be made better because I existed. That is uh, the legacy I think I I envisage for myself. Turning to marriage more specifically, what, what comes to mind when you think about marriage yesterday, today and tomorrow? Okay, if I look at yesterday coming into marriage, um, I was akin to someone who gets an education in school that has to get into the real world of employment. Uh, It's no different from a graduate who's studying and is excited about the possibilities of the real world, but goes into the real world and is hit by reality. Uh, Mike Tyson once said, you have a plan to get punched in the mouth. And it's the same true with marriage. Before I walked into marriage, I had certain idealism, I had certain theories. But when you're in the center of it all, because I think what makes marriage interesting is you're not dealing with people who are always thinking rationally. How do you relate with your partner is not applying their mind, but they're dealing in a place of emotions. Now, no one can prepare you to how navigating emotions that you can only build by experience. So before I came in, I was thinking more in a rational world where you explain, uh, let's agree on different matters. But what happens when agreement is a bit hard because of the emotions that are brewing on your partner's side, but also sometimes on your own side as well. And that has been the readjustment. But when I look at the future ahead of me, I'm excited about experience because the more you go through things, you build experience and life becomes easier. Out of curiosity, there's someone looking to get married. What would you say to them? What would you say to someone getting into marriage? If I had a message for someone in an institution of marriage, number one, um, don't get married because you're tired of being single. Because if you have not conquered singleness, you cannot conquer marriage. Think of being single as the primary to the secondary of being married. What that requires of you is if you're afraid of the coldness and it drives you to get married, you're making a problem. Because self-control is as required in singleness as in required in marriage. You get? What happens when the person you married is not as attractive as they were in the beginning? What happened if the thing, they looked different every day, you saw them, what happens if they look the same? Right? So if you have not built the character and the maturity of heart and spirit to overcome singleness, you won't be able to overcome marriage. Now, many people get married for many wrong reasons. Some, they're feeling it's too cold. 
Some people want to eat better food. Some people want to have sex every day. Some people, uh, they feel that count, the time is running out. But all those reasons are not good enough because they forget that marriage is a responsibility. It is a responsibility. It is not a place of fun. It is a place of one growing up to do the work. You don't have children for fun. No, no, no. Children are responsibility. You hear countless people crying about school fees, uh, feeding families, and so on. That's a responsibility that when we grow up, we have to take on. Now, if you don't prepare for that responsibility, you'll be disappointed. So if you cannot lead yourself as an individual, then you cannot lead anyone else in marriage. That applies to a man. And if a woman cannot take care of herself, she cannot take care of other people. I think that's what I can share. Any counsel for those already married? <laughs> if I was to speak to people who are married, I'm just one year married. I don't think I have the license to speak to you. But nonetheless, I can share the little I know from my year of experience. And what I've come to learn about marriage can best be embodied by the message uh, President Kennedy gave to the American cit citizens of America when they're going to the moon. He told them, we are going to the moon. And he repeated it three times, we are going to the moon. He repeated another time, we are going to the moon. Not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And I, I like to face marriage with this an idea that marriage is hard. It is said the worst thing you can do is to underestimate your opponent. What I would rather do is overestimate them and conquer it. But when you come prepared that says, uh, marriage is hard, then you, you respect it enough to prepare yourself. But also, it allows you, gives you the comfort that when you go through different struggles, those are part of the process. When a woman is giving birth, she deals with the labor pains. But labor pains do not make childbirth, childbearing a, a bad experience. It just means there are pains that come with a good thing. And I believe marriage in itself has certain labor pains it can, one has to endure if the fruit of marriage is to be uh, realized. So for anyone in marriage, I don't know what you're going through, but don't be surprised. It's not just your marriage that has a bit of hardship. It is the labor pains that come with every marriage. Let's talk about courtship. What are your thoughts on preparation for marriage or courtship in general? So one of the interesting things, uh, if I would go back when I'm preparing for marriage, I have no regrets with a person I married. But uh, if I was to be educated, um, I would have wished I knew certain things early on. One of those things is uh, a lot of times when we meet people, uh, people show, reveal themselves to us but sometimes we're too distracted to notice. We look at the beauty of this person and the newness of them, but we fail to see their character that will reveal itself in the very simplest of ways. And you have to realize that we are all a work in progress. But you need to be, when you understand what your partner is struggling with in character, then you can know whether you have the grace or even the character you yourself to relate with them appropriately, right? So I believe the time pre-marriage should be an ideal time. The time before you decide marrying someone should be a time get to understand this person, understand their character, understand where their strengths are, understand their weaknesses. But a lot of times when you get into, uh, when we have marriage in sight, some of us have different interests. Some of us want to sleep with people. As some of us want to, someone to marry us. And in so doing, we ignore all the red flags. We are so focused on achieving a particular end that we forget to pay attention to the things that come with it. It's the same as, uh, as someone thinking about having children. You cannot think about having children and not be conscious of the labor pains. But sometimes the beginning of relationships does not allow us to imagine the labor pains. Perhaps... It's what allows us to go through them. Perhaps if we thought about the negative, we may not have started. But I feel the Baganda is saying, So I feel the time of preparation is an ideal time for us to know what uh, 
we should wear. <laughs> so it's again the Okunja that we may know it and prepare for it accordingly. Now, a lot of people have this question at the back of their mind. How does one know the person they're with is the right partner, if that even exists? Before I married my wife, we had dated, we separated, and then remained friends. So at the time of our marriage, we were friends. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't want anything from my wife. I wasn't trying to get anything from her. I was just her friend. But I was such a friend that I cared about her. I remember the day I went to help her find a house. She had been looking for a house and she hadn't been successful. So I asked a friend of mine to give me a push to go look, find a house for my friend. Now, that stays of something powerful is that there's this person that even though they gave you nothing, you're willing to do so much for them. That is one part. Uh, the second part is my wife followed my counsel even while we were friends. If I told my wife that that is not right, that is not good, she listened to me. Now, that brought me to the idea that my wife was submitted to me even before we got married. So some people think the woman is going to submit to you after you marry her. No. If she honors, if she sees something upon your life that she honors, then she'll be submitted to you even before you marry her. And for me, in hindsight, uh, I was confident that I married the right woman. Right? But of course, on our part as well, that there were prophetic revelations of God that that was the woman for me and she received the same. So there were multiple levels, right? But I cannot dare say this is the only way it can work because God works in mysterious ways, right? And the Bible speaks about what I has not seen and what neither ear had. So which means God can do things in a new way. God can do a new thing in your life that no one has ever seen and no one has ever had. So... I'm curious to hear a little bit more about submission from a man's perspective. You cannot speak of submission without speaking of will. Uh, Paul in the Bible reminds us and says, Wives, has, has submit to your husbands, and su husbands submit to, as husbands submit to Christ. You see, the idea is, if a man is submitted to Christ, and the woman is submitted to the husband, then the will that is operating in all of them is the will of Christ. Okay? So now the problem comes, if the husband is not submitted to Christ, then the wife submits to the husband, so the will at function is the will of the husband. But the will of the husband is inferior for the destiny of marriage to be uh, realized. So a husband has to submit to Christ, and as long as they're submitted to Christ, the wife has to submit to them. Think of it as two pipes. The husband has this pipe that they attach to Christ. So it brings the life of Christ flowing through to the husband. So the wife has to come and tie to the pipe of the husband that that life of Christ may flow into her as well. For as long as that is the nature, that, that unity is how things work together. Let me give you an example. Imagine you have to walk in a dark environment. And one of us has to hold on to Christ. Now, imagine a wife walking in that darkness without holding on to her husband. She may get lost, right? But as long as the wife holds the hand of the husband, then she will continue walking with Christ. But the same is true. If the wife holds the hand of the husband and the husband isn't holding on to Christ, then they're all going to get lost. Does that make sense? Mm. So submission is a place of alignment. Uh, Jesus tells us in the Bible and says that you may be one with me as I am one with the Father. It's a place of alignment. He talks about the vine, the branch, and the leaves. You get? You don't produce fruit. You cannot produce fruit as an individual without the life of Christ in you. Right? And the life of Christ starts to flow at the moment when you submit to Christ. And the wife also starts to flow and submits to the husband. Now you have to realize that God is a God of order. When he says that the natural order will be that the wife has submits to the husband, I'll give it to you. You see, for, for God to give the husband authority, he has, 
I've phrased it another way. You see, because God honors the things he has done, because he gave a certain office of the husband and gave it a certain authority, he cannot undermine it himself. Mm. You get? So God is willing to allow the woman to submit to the husband so that the office of the husband may maintain its authority. Imagine you are a man who owned a company and you give someone charge over your company and then you go and start to give instructions to people who work in the company going across, going past the person you've given authority. What you'll do, you'll undermine them and they will not be able to exercise the position and the office they've been given. But a leader that is respectful, that understands the power of office and authority, even if someone came from the side and jumped over them, their boss and came to the owner of the company, you tell them to go to the boss. Because you created an office, you have to respect it and honor it. For as long as you do that, everyone else will do the same. So you start to realize that you don't think you'll go over your husband and think things will just work like that. And, but also in an interesting light, it, uh, there's another dimension to it. Peter and the Bible tells us, husbands, relate with your wives uh, in wisdom as a weaker vessel that your prayers may not be hindered. Right? Now, think about this. There is a place where a husband doesn't treat relate appropriately with uh, a wife and his prayers become hindered. You see, God created certain structures in place that have to be honoured for the fruit to come out. Well, as we wrap this up, we cannot talk about marriage and not talk about divorce, and comfortable as it may be. So could you share a little bit more about divorce? I heard of the story of a Nigerian worshipper um, who died as a result of domestic violence. Uh, she had endured so much violence, um, but she never got out of her marriage. Now, to some people, they saw it as the negativity of people who are determined to pursue their marriages to the end. But for me, what I saw is a thing called martyrdom. We celebrate the Uganda matters, but we if we looked at the Ghana matters making their decisions, the people in their time perhaps saw these people as stupid. They believed something so much, they're willing to lay down their lives for it. Mm. And for me, I say this with all humility because it's easier said than done. Because some people, the trials of marriage have been presented with are too grave to imagine. All I can pray for is God, that the grace is sufficient to endure the hard times marriage may present my way. But I know at the bottom of my heart that there's only one way, and that's to finish well. And my desire of life is uh, to not retreat. But I'm convinced that if my partner, um, despite my determination, to do my best to see the marriage prosper, mm -hmm. determines to disrespect or disregard my submission to the institution of marriage, I am so persuaded that the power of God could come and intervene for my account. So I have this belief that I'm not alone because I, I go through marriage determined to see to the end because of the God I serve. And I know that God I serve, whom I believe watches over me. And I, st I don't stop believing in God. For as long as I'm still breathing, I'll believe God. And that nowhere, nowhere is that presented to me than in the test testimony of Christ. We know that Christ at the death, when he was crucified, when he was breathing his last, he said, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Now you need to understand something profound. You can't say you've been forsaken unless you believe someone's going to come out for you. But we know that Christ believed his father to the very end. And that's why he said that word, because at the very end he believed. 
And that's why you can say, Father, why hast thou forsaken you? But then we see the testament of the power of God, that even death is not powerful enough to limit the workings of God. That even at, at the death of Christ, he still came back to life. And this way it gets more powerful. The glory of being seated at the right hand of the Father was a glory that was earned in the belief until the death. Now I desire so much to be in right standing with God. I desire so much to be approved of my Heavenly Father that the endurance of hardships of this world are the least price I can pay. But nonetheless, I pray for the grace that the testing of my life and the burdens I have to carry are not so heavy because I don't know if my feet will support me. The desire of my spirit is to endure to the end. But the carnal body, I only pray that the spirit of God is mighty within me to give me enough strength to endure the challenges of life.